Fame tip-off, Penn State's Nittany Lions get a first-hand look at the tall timber of Terrence Jones and the number two Wildcats next. Welcome inside Mohegan Sun Arena here in Uncasville, Connecticut, the Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off tournament. The opener, Penn State, and number two ranked Kentucky. Get after it. Now, we begin with Penn State, Kentucky, and follow with South Florida and Old Dominion, approximately 2.30 Eastern here on ESPN. Welcome aboard courtside, Mike Crispino, Tim Welsh. Kentucky second ranked. You've got Connecticut, North Carolina, all that talent. Ohio State, where do the Wildcats fit into that echelon? Well, once again, John Calipari's team is stacked and stocked, loaded with future NBA talent. They start three freshmen and two sophomores, but that's not unusual for John. He gets them in, gets them out quick, a lot of wins. And a look now at our one-on-one, -on -one. two talented players. Young man in the backcourt for Penn State, Patrick Chambers. Tim Frazier at 6'1", leads the Big Ten in those categories to begin with. Oh, he's taking off where Taylor Battle left off his backcourt mate from a year ago, the great Penn State player. Frazier gets to the rim, assists, also leads him in steals. Terrence Jones, a warrior for John Calipari, especially on the glass. In the starting lineups for Penn State, they've started the season 3-0. Trey Lewis, a freshman in the backcourt. Cameron Woodyard there. Veteran presence in the middle, Billy Oliver, along with Sasha Borovinet, the sophomore. And for Kentucky, Marcus Teague, the freshman, Deron Lamb, the sophomore in the backcourt, Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, the freshman forward, Terrence Jones, we talked about, and Anthony Davis, perhaps the best of the bunch. Where's number 23 for John Calipari and Kentucky? So the officials for this afternoon, Bob Adams, Gary Tracy, Kevin Ferguson, as Penn State dressed in the road blue to begin and Kentucky in the home white. Kentucky's been here since playing in New York earlier in the week, a win over Kansas. So they've been on a, a long road trip. Not a pl bad place to be, a little NYC for the Wildcats, then up here at the beautiful Mohegan Sun and John Calipari back in his old haunting grounds, started his great coaching, head coaching career, not far from here at UMass. So Kentucky with it. Faces Penn State's defense. They move left to right. Long jumper off the front rim, no good. By the Cats to start. The Wildcats are gonna attack you in a man-to-man -man pressure. They get up in your face. They'll do some switching on pick and rolls. A lot of communication. They've got a lot of interchangeable parts, especially on the front line. A turnover whistle early on Tim Frazier. So Patrick Chambers in his first season at Penn State takes over for Ed DeCellis. Had two very fine seasons at Boston University. In a word, he's loaded with energy. Cal Parry still looking for his first national championship, but an astounding record at Kentucky and before that Memphis and UMass. Kentucky had a spirited practice yesterday, really working a lot on the pick and roll. John Calipari trying to implement the pick and roll with this young group. And he really whistled down low against Penn State. And the third member of our broadcast crew here this afternoon joins us now, Andy Katz. Believe it or not, there are a couple issues for Kentucky. You wouldn't know that by their scores, but Kentucky very concerned about the way they've started games against Marist and against Kansas. John Calvary not happy with those first 20 minutes, but then at halftime, this team has been able to flip a switch, and they blew out Marist uh, last weekend, and then against Kansas, really stretched that lead in the second half. They just need to learn. This is young team still need to learn to focus to come out at the beginning of the game the way they have in the second 20. Back to you guys. All right, thank you, Andy. Well, it, it certainly gives the head coach something to work on. Well, yeah, I, you know, and John understands you know, this is a marathon, and, and with the young team, he's got he's constantly teaching. It's nice to get these one and done guys, and by the end of the year they're ready, but at the beginning of the year they're not ready, especially they think they are, but they're not, and that's why John constantly is teaching this young group. Marcus Teague drills the three ball, and it's an early Kentucky lead. They go with full court pressure. Against Penn State off a 19 and 15 season last year, nine and nine in Big Ten play, but it was their Big Ten tournament which was the shocker. They knocked off Michigan State, Wisconsin.
Wisconsin, Indiana got to the final before losing to Ohio State. That's Oliver from the corner. That, they like to use him out on the perimeter quite a bit. Down on the low post, Jones tries to feed it to a teammate. He does get it down there on the bounce to Michael Kidd Gilchrist and Kentucky leads 5 0. Well, there you see, Mike, the value of Terrence Jones. A nice little bounce pass from the mid post. Not trying to force anything, but turned, squared, really direct. Penn State finally breaks the pressure, and a little floater ends up short. A shot blocked, and the Nittany Lions come up with it. And the corner jumper dropped in by Billy Oliver, the junior from Chatham, New Jersey. That's what Billy Oliver could do. All but two of his field goals this year have been from the three-point line. He's going to pick and pop and return from the top. Out on the baseline, a little pull-up is off target. And a foul is whistled down low on Cameron, Cameron Woodyard. Their most experienced player is playing in his 80th game as a member of the Penn State program. It's been a tough go for Penn State basketball over the years. They had a good season last year. But they're hoping to re-energize again with Patrick Chambers. Well, Eddie DeCellis did a terrific job at Penn State, especially last season getting to the tournament. He felt like he needed a change, and Patrick really has brought a lot of enthusiasm to the floor. You see this young group, they really, they really get after you defensively. I don't know if they have the talent to make a push to the Big Ten, even to get to the middle, but you know this program is headed again in the right direction with all their youth and energy on the sideline. One thing about their practice is there's a ton of communication going on. Five men chatting up the defense, and the runner goes in. Deron Lamb, that's what he can do. Slashing in, puts the floater up and good. Well, Lamb is multi-talented, multi-dimensional. He'll play some point guard as well when Teague comes out of the game. And what they want to do both against man and the zone is attack the, attack the gaps. And Deron Lamb can do that for John Calipari. Now the beauty of Lamb, Tim Welch, is he can shoot it from outside too. So if, if he gets it going outside and then you come up and defend him, he can go right by you. Well, he's a, a real complete player for John Calipari. Very important because with Teague, the youth at the point guard spot, he's gonna have to lean on Lamb, not only for experience, but leadership out there, especially in tough times. The Lions break the pressure in traffic and banked up and in. That was a pretty shot that time by Tim Frazier, who averages 18 points a game for Penn State. Well, that's what Frazier likes to do, Mike. He will keep his dribble even in the lane. You think he's going to dribble it back out, and then he'll change directions and get right, go right to the rim. Frazier had a real breakout game against Michigan State in the Big Ten Tournament. 22 points, eight rebounds, six assists in that upset. As Penn State got to the NCAA Tournament. Well, again, there's Marcus Teague, and he's coming out of the game. Another teaching moment for John Calipari. Just trying to go a little bit too quickly out, out there, trying to do things on his own instead of let, taking what the defense gives him. And that will come with experience. You saw it in the first half, especially in the Kansas game earlier this week, where he just left his feet. He went too deep in transition. Too many turnovers. John had to go to Lamb to settle him down. But Teague's got a lot of talent. He'll bring him back quickly. Darius Miller replaces him, a senior from Maysville, Kentucky. As the Nittany Lions turn it over, here come the Cats. Jones has it stripped, got it back, puts it up, and he is fouled. Tim Frazier, the heart and soul of Penn State, has his team off to a solid start here against the second-ranked Wildcats. Kentucky an early 8-5 lead, and we send it over to Andy Katz. I'll tell you, it, when Penn State head coach Ed DeCellis left Penn State to go to Navy, it really did shock a lot of people because he had gotten Penn State to the NCAA tournament. That was definitely the goal to do, obviously, in his long tenure that he was an alumnus. But Penn State didn't show the commitment. And he looked at the Naval Academy after thinking long and hard. He'd once talked to his late friend Skip Prosser about the Naval Academy and what it meant to him. He saw it as a great opportunity. 
leaving a Penn State program in better spot than he was when he originally arrived. This program had been to the NCAA tournament last season after him. They'd been to the NIT. They'd won the NIT. And now they're, he's, he's left it on good footing. As we can see here, Penn State beating a very good Long Island team just recently. They are the NEC favorites. So he left it better than he started, but it was a little bit of a surprise when he went to the Naval Academy and left his alma mater. Guys? Thank you, Andy. Uh, Ed DeCellis, a uh, member of Bruce Parkhill's staff, uh, going back a couple of decades, and it was a surprise. Uh, he said that he just felt a sense of commitment to the, the academy-type athletes and almost a sense of duty himself as a coach to go there, and he did. A jumper from the corner from Michael Kidd Gilchrist. He's got some range, the kid from St. Patrick's in New Jersey. But just right there, tremendous spacing on the court and making the quick extra pass. The ball is not held at any point, just the quick ball reversal before the defense can shift for the closeout in the corner. This is Frazier, duck in, shot blocked, and a whistle. And John Calipari protests the call. Barking early this morning, or this afternoon, it's just past noon time here in the East Coast, and uh, officials said it was on underneath, but John saw all ball there. What's interesting about coaches like Calipari, Jim Calhoun, Jim Bayheim, that they're they're never really satisfied. There's always something that his team can do better, even in the opening minutes of a game that just started. Well, that's why they're great. That's why they're, they're at the top of their profession. And, and going back to yesterday's practice with John, I mean, teaching every moment of every second of the practice to these young players and breaking things down. And he's not satisfied. He knows it's still mid-November, and there's a long way to go. But he expects excellence early. Two misses at the free throw line by Frazier. Kyle Wiltshire is in the ballgame, has the ball. Goes to the little jump hook and banks it home. Wiltshire, he's a freshman from Portland, Oregon. Well, John Calipari really likes his skill level. Talked yesterday about trying to get him into the, into the rotation early today. Didn't play a lot against Kansas. Uh, he wants Kyle Wiltshire to be part of this rotation, even though he is a young player. Still needs to get a little stronger. Frazier forced it up into the teeth of the Wildcat defense. Gilchrist. He's going to be whistled for an offensive foul. Some pushing and shoving here. Now the defender outside that little semicircle. You'll take a look here. Well, the restricted arm inside. And here you see the nice dish. He's way outside the restricted area. Oliver does a nice job of taking the charge. You don't have to take it square in the chest as long as you are not moving when the man goes into a shot. Kid Gilchrist goes to the bench with two personals. As Penn State trying to get some offense going, and the ball deflected out of bounds. Jermaine Marshall has entered the game, number 11. He's a sophomore from Edwards, Pennsylvania for Penn State. So the three-foot restricted area arc implemented. Secondary defenders cannot draw a, car, a charge in that marked area under the basket. Right, in, in transition, Mike, you might say, who's the secondary defender? When there is a fast break, everyone is a secondary defender. That time, Oliver did a nice job of getting way outside the arc. Glenn with a steal. He'll go in ahead of the field and lay it in. And Kentucky up early, 16-5. Defense leads to offense. No question about it. They're going to get up in the passing lanes. High, active hands, a lot of switching, a lot of overplay. Kentucky in their 109th season of basketball, doing it defensively. Well, that's what you love about Kentucky. They have a lot of commitment to defense early because they understand if they get into a half-court game, I don't think they're ready for a grinded-out half-court game right now. So they're really pushing up on people, John, emphasizing overplay and pressure. 8-0 run here in the last three minutes for Kentucky, a 29-9 season last year. And a Final Four defeat at the hands of Connecticut, the eventual defending or defending champs who won it for the third time under Jim Calhoun. And, uh, you know, the one thing about Calipari's teams, and you mentioned it earlier, young players, every year so good, they move on to the next level. He's got to restart the engines almost when the season starts. He does, and that's why I said, you know, getting into a half-court game means a lot of precision and execution. 
But this team is, I was very impressed yesterday, all the plays that John has put in and is putting in high basketball IQ amongst this group. Penn State having trouble with the extended defense right now. And a shot blocked again. That time Teague able to reject. And a lamb, an offensive foul. Now that restricted arc ends near the baseline, but that was still an offensive foul and a good call. Well, Kentucky right now in transition, they have to understand that Penn State, the only way basically they have a chance to stop them. They don't have a lot of shot blockers. They don't have the quickness is they're going to throw their bodies out in front of people. So Kentucky either has to drive and kick or stop on a jump stop and take that little mid-range jumper. Feed down low and a nice finish that time by John Graham, who's a freshman from Baltimore, Maryland, 6'8", 240. Everything's been on the interior offensively for the most part. Wilcher's a little hook shot, and he's hacked. Wilcher's got a lot of skill. He can step out and shoot. He's a good passer. You show a little deft left and right hook. He hit the bank shot earlier with the right hook. And you've got Tommy Heinsohn and Dan Issel and Cliff Hagen here from the old days. They, they appreciate that old school hook shot. Wilcher, 6'9", comes from Portland, Oregon. So uh, a little bit of change in the climate for him. Here's Tommy uh, with the Celtics in lockout mode. He's uh, here, obviously, a member of the Hall of Fame. Talking to him before the game, and Tommy said, all the work we did to start that NBA Players Union, and they want to just take it apart, he wasn't happy. Well, Dan Essel is here as well, former great Kentucky player, and NBA and ABA star. And it's just a, it's a shame right now that they can't figure out a way to split a lot of money. It's good for college hoop because the hoop fans around the country are going to focus in on these games. Teams like Kentucky. I think it's going to be a superior year in college basketball as far as talent at the top. I mean, you talk about talent at the top, Mike. We talked about it earlier. Kentucky, Ohio State, North Carolina, Syracuse, Connecticut. I think clearly those five teams are the best in college basketball right now. Well, the Big Ten has, you know, some real good teams there. A blocking calls. Wilcher at 6'9", takes it to the hole. Well, Wilcher, as we said, he can shoot the ball. He's got the right and left hook. That time, putting the ball on the floor. A little fortunate there. Probably out of control, but drew the foul. John Graham whistled for it. That's his second. John Calipari, who got his team to the Final Four a couple years ago, lost five first-round picks to the NBA. Just the seventh Kentucky coach in 80 years. When you talk about the players they lost, not many people speak about Josh Harrelson except the coaching staff, and he was a big part of that group as well last year just because of his presence defensively down in the low block. Smothering man-to-man -man defense by the Wildcats. There's nothing there right now for Penn State. Frazier goes with a little jump hook in the lane, challenging the Wildcats big men. Well, Davis, is, if he's going to make a play on Frazier, he's got to step up sooner. And Davis plays point guard for the moment and feeds Wiltshire for a layup. A nice little one-two punch. You've got Davis at 6'10", and Wiltshire at 6'9", both playing like wing forwards. 6'10", acting like Magic Johnson for the moment. Frazier sees an opening and able to get it to go. So Tim Frazier challenging back-to-back -back and scoring. Well, he's a one-man wrecking crew, and Taylor Battle taught him well. And another offensive foul. That's the third on the Wildcats already in the opening eight minutes. Well, they, they had this problem against Kansas in the first half, going too deep into the paint. They have to understand the help defense. They have to read the defense, drive and kick. Kentucky's tough on the perimeter. They understand the big guys can even make plays. High low. Welcome back to 
Mohegan Sun Arena. Mike Crispino, Tim Welsh, Andy Katz. Kentucky 22-11 early. This Penn State team lost four senior starters from last year's club, including Taylor Battle, their all-time school's leading scorer. And just the third man in NCAA history to have 2,000 points, 600 rebounds, 500 assists. Taylor Battle was one of the guards in, this, in the country that I, I thought was pretty much unguardable. I mean, off the bounce from the three-point line, and, and Tim Frazier's been playing with him, played with him the last two seasons. I think learned a lot on how to be a complete player out there on the floor, not only how to get his own points, but to create for his teammates as well. And if you practice against somebody like Taylor Battle every day, that's got to make you better. It does. And Gilchrist, now as Kid Gilchrist is out there guarding Frazier, and John Calipari talked about that. We're, we're going to put Kil, Kid Gilchrist on the other team's best offensive player out on the perimeter. And now you see him chasing Frazier off the screens on the baseline. Uh, Gilchrist 6-7, and Frazier 6-1. Now he spins inside, gives it up to a teammate off the side of the rim and deflected out of bounds. The three-pointer. It came from Cameron Wood that time, which is a little unusual, although he can shoot it from out there. Patrick Chambers, two years at Boston University, won 42 games. If he looks familiar to you. You probably saw him on Villanova's bench for five years with Jay Wright before he went to Boston University. Well, this is a little taste of Jay Wright basketball here. One, two, two, three-quarter pass, press back to man-to-man. -to -man. Overplay, a lot of pressure on the perimeter. Lamb with a drive and a little scoop shot that goes in off glass. Well, that's what Lamb does. On the ball reversal, he found a seam on the wing. Nice body control off the window. That was not an easy conversion. So Jermaine Marshall gives it up to Frazier. A lamb will guard Frazier. Kentucky doing some switches on the exchanges on the perimeter. Nice job on the overplay. Lamb on the baseline on the bounce pass picked off by Gilchrist. Here he comes. Feeds Lamb. Pull up is short, but tipped in. And a nice move that time by Anthony Davis. Kentucky having their way, 26-11. Well, that's classic help the helper on the last defensive play. Great rotations. One man got beat. Help came. The second helper with the steal. Open in the corner for three. Rims in and out that time. Penn State came up with it. Ross Travis off the bench, a freshman from Minnesota. And a foul called on the Wildcats. Well, Mike, we talked about helping the helper. Here you see him getting beat on the baseline, but on the rotation, Kid Gilchrist rotates down as the third helper, and then the nice finish, and then the tap in by Davis on the miss. So going to the line will be Tim Frazier. Stands 6'1", but a 34-inch vertical leap. He missed another free throw. He missed three in a row. When you talk about defensive rotations, that's the hard, one of the hardest things to teach in man-to-man, -man, especially to a young group, is when you get beat, you, you have to have confidence your help is going to come, but then if you're going to help, you have to be confident that someone's going to help you with the next pass. So it's really on a chain out there, and that's hard for a young group to take in early. That's why you constantly are doing shell drill, shell drill, shell drill. Kentucky looks very good in their rotations so far today. Frazier leads the way, one of two from the line, 26-12. And stayed a little zone here, nice penetration into the gaps by Teague. A little pull up is off the side rim and a foul on the scramble for the rebound. And we send it over to the third member of our crew, Andy Katz. What's interesting about this Kentucky team is the diversity that John Calipari has at his disposal. And Kyle Wilcher, we're seeing a lot of him er early. You only saw him for three minutes against Kansas. And the reason being is that game just was not suited to him. 
it was much more of an up and down game. Kansas a lot more physical. And John Calipari saying after that game that he wants to find the right times to use Wilcher, a player that he thinks might be their most skilled player. And talked very highly about him in the preseason. He played 19 minutes against Maris, had 14 points, but only three against Kansas. I think in a game like this against Penn State, and regardless of who they play on Sunday with that South Florida Old Dominion, uh, you will see a lot of Kyle Wilcher. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, Wiltshire's got skills, no question. He's got size. It's a nice combination. Well, the question is for him, as is most young big guys, their defensive ability down on the low block. Like, can you play without getting into foul trouble? Can you move your feet? Wiltshire has the offensive skill, but right now, right now he's not there defensively yet. Jones got a piece of that three-point attempt from Trey Lewis. Now Wiltshire will fire from long range off the sideboard. Let's see, Penn State call for a traveling violation. Ron Lamb comes back in, Wiltshire comes out. Wiltshire, an eight point effort. He showed you a little of everything right hand, left hand hook, putting the ball on the ground and looking to shoot the three as well. And then uh, Coach Cal got him the hook after he tried the three pointer. Do you think there was some oh, significance in that? I think there might be a subliminal <laughs> message there somehow. John's famous for doing that. He does it very well. Well, the players, as you know, having been with Providence, Iona, and a lot of places, uh, cues before that, they always have a question why am I coming out? Do you always have to give them a reason? No. I think the look sometimes just, all you have to do is look at them. <laughs> with, that, with that stare, and they understand. But, well, good effort, though, by Wilcher. Pull up baseline as an air ball. Here comes the 6'10 point guard. Lamb into the paint. Deals to the open man, Jones, and the rainbow three drops in. And Patrick Chambers has got to stop the bleeding here. 32 12 Wildcats. Well, there was a guy, Mike, that played back in your and my day. His name was Magic Johnson. He was about 6'10", and he was famous for taking the ball off the glass. And then you see Jones from the three, but, but Davis off the rim, push it with the push, then the dish to Lamb, and then Dan Lamb understanding that where your teammates are going to be. Great spacing out there in the on the court, the driving kick for Kentucky. The Kentucky, uh, the preseason SEC number one pick. They're on a 10 1 run. But this team, and, and I'm just going to go out on a limb a little bit, this team may have more ability than that 2010 team had, in that everybody can score the ball, everyone can handle, and everyone can pass. They've and got, I didn't mention rebound. They have a lot of answers. And the thing that I like early is their defensive versatility you see a lot of switching out there in the perimeter their communication is is strong uh, they can switch the one two three four and sometimes the five so that's really a plus and here you see on the pick and roll they're staying with with Frazier right into the paint and a rebound off the three-point miss and stayed on the boards here with a couple opportunities try another three and he missed three in a row. Well, it's very difficult to score, Mike, when every shot is contested by a long six-foot-nine wingspan arm. Lamb will try a three, and he drills it. And Kentucky playing free and easy, leading 35-12. Well, they have usually when you're on the road for a while, sometimes you get a little stale. But Kentucky is not stale. They came ready to play this afternoon. Another three off the mark, short this time by Frazier. Penn State getting frustrated too early in the shot clock there on that last possession. And Lamb knocks over the coach oh, Chambers on the way back as Kentucky all smiles. It's all going their way. Again, Mike, no pass on that possession for Penn State. This could get real ugly if they don't start moving the ball a little bit. And Lamb tried to take it to the basket, but he's fouled. <laughs> Patrick Chambers just a moment ago got in the, the line of fire after the basket. Watch what happens. Back down the sideline come the Wildcats. Run over the Nittany Lion coach.
Mike Crispino, Tim Welch, Andy Katz, Kentucky rolling 38 to 12. Deron Lamb just turned 21 a couple of weeks ago. A couple of years at Oak Hill Academy. He is a sensational sophomore. Well, he does a lot of things for John. He gets into the lane. He can drive and dish. He can finish from the wing area. He pushes it in transition. He can play the backup point. And last year, 49% three-point shooter. This year, he's on fire early. That's a big number, 49% from outside the arc. That's for sure. As Deron Lamb has a word with the officials, and we send it over to Andy Katz. The one problem for Deron Lamb last season was consistency, which you would expect for a freshman. He had 32 against Winthrop, and then at times he would disappear in the SEC. Now, earlier in the fall, John Calperi telling me he thought Deron Lamb would be his best player. Now it's easy for Cal to say that because he's got a, a choice. He could go Lamb, he could go Anthony Davis, he could go Terrence Jones. Uh, he's got a lot of options when he names his own top player, but there was one point where he was saying it was Deron, Deron Lamb, and here for the first 20 minutes, he's certainly playing like the best player on this team. Thank you, Andy. Well, you gotta be careful, Tim, don't you? You can't say one guy's better than the other guy when you got McDonald's All-Americans all around your roster. That's yeah, easy to say. I mean, John keeps them all in check. He, he's got a lot of high-profile guys, everybody. But, you know, John is the man. He makes, he understands how to work these guys psychologically. But I, I don't know if I could say who the best player in Kentucky is, but I think Deron Lamb is the most important player for John because he can play that backup point because of his experience, because of his defensive understanding of the system. And, the ability to knock down the shot as well. And if the Wildcats want to go deep in the NCAA tournament, they need to have that important player they can go to, that that crunch time guy. Oliver deep in the corner, and that's one of ten now by Penn State from outside the arc. The dribble penetration, the jumper by Miller, and it's boarded by a little Tim Frazier. Frazier whistled as Teague ran into him. John Calipari's trying to implement a lot more pick and roll into their offense. They've really always been a dribble driving kick type team and very successful at that so far today. But as they move forward, he understands people are going to take away different angles on the dribble drive, start to scout it better. And he thinks this team can be a good pick and roll basketball team as they move forward. And in you know, crunch time situations, tournament play, you need that, don't you? You need to be able to score in a variety of ways. You do, and I think he understands, you know, the dribble drive is great. Brandon Knight, you know, when you have players like that, it's it's a little different. You know, you can just spread the court and beat anybody off the bounce, and I think Marcus T can do that as well. I think this team may be more suited for some different style here and there. Oh, Sasha. Borobniak will go to the line here. He's a sophomore from Serbia, 6'9". He's a starter. Played a few minutes to start the ball game. And on the line for the Nittany Lions. Kentucky, the all-time winningest program in college basketball. Followed by Kansas, North Carolina, Duke, Syracuse. A lot of tradition for the Wildcats. Wiltshire ducks in, finds a teammate at the last second, and he'll get his teammate to the line, Aloy Vargas. Well, you see why John Calipari likes Kyle Wiltshire, just his versatility out there from kind of that elbow area, off the bounce, leaves his feet, Really know where to go, but maybe he knew where he was going with the nice little dish to Vargas. So Wiltshire sets up Vargas, a senior from the Dominican Republic, and he's got a free throw, 41-13, Kentucky. And John Calipari just uh, finished coaching the Dominican Republic's national team. Down, taken down by Trey Lewis. Lewis, little pull-up pop, and that one's off the front rim. Good push that time by Penn State, but not able to convert. As Teague wants to go to the basket, taken away by the Nittany Lions. Frazier back the other way, one on two. 
Feeds for the three, and that one's off the mark. Trey Lewis and the Nittany Lions are, just cannot find it from three-point range. That would make a difference. They hope to climb back in this well, thing. Especially off the misses or off turnovers, they have to try to push and get easy baskets because in the half court, Kentucky's just smothered Penn State. Penn State has not scored a field goal in almost eight minutes. As Kentucky's defense has really clamped down. And they've been missing at the free throw line too. That's four misses by Tim Frazier. Lamb slices in, banks it home. Made that play a couple of times already this afternoon. Well, there's no NBA so far this season, Mike, but right there, that's an NBA guard move. Just explosive body control and then soft off the window. Robniak gives it up to Trey Lewis. Now Oliver, they kick outside. Little 15-footer in the lane, and that rims in and out. Good push ahead up with the pass. Miller stop and go, move, strip though. Nice play defensively by Billy Oliver. Robniak inside and he's rejected. Gets his own rebound, goes left-handed, missed it. And after the scrum, the Wildcats end. Timeout on the floor, Kentucky playing like the second ranked team in the country. Ron Lamb could do a lot of things for John Calipari, especially finishing traffic. To the Basketball Hall of Fame's tip-off tournament. We're here at Mohegan Sun Arena, Uncasville, Connecticut. Kentucky kicking the day's activities off. Eight different colleges playing. And coming up next, ODU, Old Dominion, takes on South Florida. John Calipari's Wildcats at their peak right now so far in this one. Well, they are. They, they really get after you defensively. And John's playing, got his team ready to play early today at noon. And South Florida, Old Dominion. Right after this, uh, Old Dominion struggling a little bit. Lost a lot of players from last year's NCAA tournament team. So Lamb will play the point. Jared Polson is coming to the game. Where's number five? Nicholasville, Kentucky. Well, John was not happy in that last transition with Marcus Teague. Again, going too deep in the paint with nowhere to go and turning it over. Shot clock down to three. They got to get something, and they do, but it's off the mark short by Loy Vargas. So good defensive sequence that time by Penn State. So the Nittany Lions of the Big Ten will be facing some tough competition. Ohio State good again. Wisconsin, Purdue. Robbie Hummel back healthy. Had a good game early in the season for the Boilermakers. Illinois is always tough. Indiana, I mean, Tom Crean now, he's been there for a few seasons. you got to believe he'll get it going for Indiana. Well, they've had a better recruiting class. They have more talent in the program than they've ever had. And I think Tommy, having coached against him for many years at Marquette, he's, he is a winning coach. So he's had some injuries over the past few years, but I think they're ready to take the next step in Bloomington. It's always tough to replace a legend after Bob Knight left uh, anywhere, right? Kentucky the same way. It's not always easy to be the next guy and to replace the legend. Well, Tubby Smith did a terrific job replacing Rick Pitino and brought them another national championship. And well, John knows the pressure's always on at Kentucky, but he has delivered plus since he's been there. The last national championship won by Tubby Smith at Kentucky, 1998. And Penn State continues to struggle at the free throw line. They're only 5 of 31 from the field, and they've missed a number of free throws as well. 
So everything's gone wrong here in the first half for the Nittany Lions. Show a little zone here to make Kentucky beat them from the perimeter, but they'll try to attack the gaps as we see here now with Wiltshire. Wiltshire went left hand at rims in and out. So the big man, ambidextrous with an attempt. Fade away. Oh, rainbow, no good. Boarded by the Lions. Open three from the corner is short. And again, they cannot find the range from three-point range. Even when they're open, Penn State's short arming just worried about those long Kentucky closeouts coming at them. Under two minutes remaining here in the first half. Kentucky 2-0 to start the season. Penn State 3-0. Wiltshire now driving hard, and a backer goes in and out. Loves to put the ball on the floor. Wiltshire's showing a lot of versatility from that high post area. Another try from the corner, and another miss by Penn State, and a foul. Off the ball that time, coming up at halftime. Andy Katz with us, Katz's corner. And Fran Fraschilla will break down Kentucky. Highlights and stats as well as we bring you coverage of the Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off here at Mohegan Sun Arena. And you were talking about Kentucky being on the road since Tuesday they played Kansas at Madison Square Garden. Now that can be a good thing, you get a controlled atmosphere. The guys get to, I'm sure, work on their academic stuff and also get practice time and, and kind of bond together early. Mike, I like it in the beginning of the season. At the end of the year, if you're on a lo long road trip, I don't like it because of the fact that you're a little bit worn out. You like to be home when you can be home. Practices are shorter. But at the beginning of the season, especially with the young group, it's great to be not only on the practice floor, but in the meeting rooms and the in the restaurants, on the bus, you get a lot of quality time. There's not as much pressure early in the season, more teaching time. Uh, the coaches aren't as uptight as when you're in your league play. So it's a good time of year. It's almost like being on a foreign trip in the, in the summer. But it's John's really made things, I think, simple for this group. But he's now trying to expand his playbook yesterday. And I think they're taking well to it. Penn State, there's a lid on it from three-point range for them. Now, you just said coaches get up tight. Are you sure about that? Well, I can tell you one thing. I'm an ex-coach, and I'm not up tight today. <laughs> so I, it's not the same feeling I used to have on game day, that's for sure, which is nice. And Wiltshire shows you that he can shoot it from 20 feet plus. Well, you could see why John Calipari has told everyone that will listen, I want to get this guy into the rotation. He will be an important piece of our front line as we move forward today, showing a lot of skill. Well, if Kentucky can shoot it from outside, on top of all their athleticism, that is going to be a tough combination to deal with. Penn State has not scored from the field in 10 minutes. Finally, they get something oh, high percentage and then the miss. But the follow is good by John Graham, beats the buzzer. And an awesome performance by Kentucky in the first half. Patrick Chambers and the Nittany Lions have a lot of regrouping to do. There's no question about it. Pat was out there high-fiving his basketball team, but they've got a lot of offensive ability to show in the second half. All right, Andy Katz standing by with John Calipari. All right, thanks, Mike. John, uh, you were slow to put, sort of put Kyle Wilcher into the last two games. Why Not has he been so The last two games, the last game. Last game I was. Because the game was so physical. But I told him last night, if you don't come up with balls and defend, we get in league, I can't play you. So today there were plays again that he didn't come up with rebounds. I know what he can do offensively. But you can't go basket for basket in the SEC and win. You can't. So every day he goes against Terrence Jones and Anthony Davis. If you'll play, you'll get better. But he's got to come up with rebounds and balls. If not, it's not that I don't want to play him. It just makes it hard. What makes him so effective offensively? Skill level. He's got a great skill level. He's got a great feel for the game. He's more athletic than you think. Um, he, but, but again, it's hard to leave him in if you don't defend and rebound. Because I can leave him in for the whole half if he defends. And you know what? He's going to learn. He's a freshman. You just raise the bar and say, you got no choice. 
You either do this or I can't play you, and it's on you. You want to play? You'll do it. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Back to you, Mike. All right, Andy. And John Calipari is Kentucky oh. leads 47-15 at the break. Back with more halftime activities after this. Ten in this Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off tournament on ESPN. Mike Crispino along with Tim Welch. And we knew Kentucky was a powerhouse, Tim and they proved it in that first 20 minutes. A lot of answers, not only offensively, but defensively. Switching up in the passing lanes, aggressiveness, no looks for Penn State, no clean looks. I mean, they stopped, shot 16%, that's all you need to know, and they didn't have many openings out there because of Kentucky's aggressiveness on the defensive end of the floor. Yeah, their length and their unselfishness, and Patrick Chambers has a big assignment here in the second half. Find a way to get his team back in this thing. Let's send it over to Andy Katz. Well, thanks, guys. And talking to Pat coming onto the floor here at the second half start, he said, look, this second 20 is about a young team trying to get back its confidence. This was their first big game, and clearly they got knocked back quite a bit. He said Kentucky's obviously very talented at every position, but this second half they've got to find a way to sort of get their rotations down and more than anything get their confidence back. And so they're looking at this as a fresh 20. Forget that first 20. In their minds, it may be 0-0. Well, that's, uh, that's certainly a, a way to look at it. You've got to find a way to get some confidence. So while you play these early season games, I mean, it can be great for your confidence, but it can be shattering, too. Well, it's the only way you can look at it. He understands. They're not ready for prime time. He's got 11 freshmen and sophomores. They're playing against an elite, elite program in Kentucky, a team that is ready for prime time as young as they are. And he also knows they have another game tomorrow. So let's get better in the second half. Let's not judge. Let's not look at the scoreboard. Let's judge on our play here in the last 20. Then save man-to-man -man defense to begin. Just Marcus Teague in a pick and roll and a foul on the Nittany Lions. Just one senior, Cameron Woodyard, has been with the program throughout. As you mentioned, six freshmen, five sophomores. And I think the underclassmen in a program like Penn State very important. You got to get them to develop. You got to get them to stay for the four years and, and hope to have success as they become upperclassmen. Well, Ed DeCellis is no fool. I've known him a long time. He's a very good coach, and uh, he may have seen this coming. You know, the program really was trying to. They're in a regard right now. They. they and it's hard to do that at a high level. And right now, Pat Chambers is, has to be patient with his club. And a long miss by Lamb. Well, the Chellis, the thought was he was hoping to get an extension, and the university wasn't ready to do it. That's one reason he started to look around. He ended up going to Navy. Three-pointer goes down for the Nittany Lions. That's a rare sight. Well, they lost a very, very good coach and even a better person than a Penn State alum. So shame on them if, if they couldn't keep, they didn't try to keep him. But they did make a good move in hiring Pat Chambers. He's the first head coach at Penn State in 28 years. It didn't come from Bruce Parkhill's staff going back almost three decades. So they've had that tradition at Penn State on the basketball side as far as coaching goes. Well, they're in, they have a lot of reorganizing going on right now, but they've got a, the man for the future running their basketball program in Pat Chambers. And good, solid guy. Meanwhile, Kentucky 7 of 10 from outside the arc, 70%. Frazier in heavy traffic, lost the ball, ends up on the ground. Oh, behind the back. And a Wildcats scramble. And a timeout called by Penn State. And there's a timeout on the floor. The Wildcats in a big way on top of Penn State. Two unbeatens here early in the college basketball season. Kentucky in a big way, 50 to 18 with the lead. Mike Crispino, Tim Welch, joined by third member of our crew, Andy Katz. Mike and Tim, one thing that's going to be interesting to watch throughout the course of this early part of the season is how Darius Miller plays. And you might say, well, he's not as much of a headline guy as certainly these freshmen. But each of John Calipari's first three seasons, he's had that veteran older guy. First, it was Patrick Patterson, who certainly was a heritable player, an elite player, recruited by Florida and Duke. Then last season, it was Josh Harrelson, who played himself into a second round pick. And now it's Darius Miller, who is the veteran guy, the only, well, one of two seniors, but the one of the, one of the two seniors that's been here throughout the course of his career, and has been a strong balance for this team, great respect within the locker room, and allows him to get a 
veteran presence with all these hyped newcomers and really knows his role and understands that he's going to be a huge glue guy for the Kentucky throughout the course of the season. It's important to have some upperclassmen and some leadership, as Andy mentioned. Tim, even with the talent that Kentucky has. So we talk about maturity and leadership. That's where Darius Miller comes into play. He started 37 games out of 38 a year ago. Now he's not starting. He's replaced by a freshman. So what does that tell you? I mean, he's not throwing chairs around the locker room. He's being a leader. He understands. Uh, John says we have six starters anyway, which yeah. it's nice. That's coach speak. The player knows he's not a starter after being in the starter starting lineup all last season. But... Hey, you're a senior, you understand there's a there's a formula to success and John Calipari knows what it is and bringing Miller in off the bench is certainly a big, big plus. He's had three straight number one ranked recruiting classes as John Calipari did lose Stacy Poole, who was a member of the 2010 class, did transfer. Uh, just didn't feel like he was going to be able to play. And, and when you see these blue chippers coming in year after year, if you don't feel like you're you're fitting into the rotation, so to speak, you can see why a player might move on. On three, and that one rattles home as Penn State's been able to hit a couple here to start the second half. Matt Glover, the sophomore from Orange, California. Kentucky's defense is not at the level it was in the first half. And that's the hardest thing to do as a coach. You go in with a 30-point-plus 30 plus lead, 30 point plus lead at halftime to say, okay, let's play at 0-0. Sure, Pat Chambers is saying that. They're playing loose and easy. But defensively, to come out with that intensity is a little bit harder when you have the lead. Penn State crashing the boards but couldn't convert. Michael Kidd Gilchrist handling the ball. And now he'll fire a three, rims in and out. Nice rebound that time by Ross Travis. Frazier with an attack of the rim, and he is fouled. Frazier is going to be an important piece as they head into Big Ten play, not because of his scoring ability, but his ability to lift these young players and put them on his back, but also to help them grow. There's a long way to go from Penn State, but these other guys have to follow Tim Frazier's lead. He, he's been a big time player, an important piece since he was a freshman. Now he has to pass that along to these younger players for Pat Chambers. Well, Frazier's a junior from Houston. Uh, one thing about Pat Chambers early in his Penn State coaching career, he likes to play a lot of players. He's got nine averaging right around 14 minutes of ball game. So, uh, it's something that uh, you could see developing, perhaps, as the season progresses. Well, he's trying to put his style and implement it, you know, the pressing, the trapping. They had 30 steals in their first three games this year, 10 steals a game. That's tremendous, but they've stepped up their competition today. They haven't answered offensively, but defensively, I thought that they've been very solid, been in good position, played with a lot of aggression. Wiltshire on a low box, a nice feed to Gilchrist who flushes it. Well, there you see that mid-post action that John Calipari loves. They step up the post about two steps above the low box. They run cutters on the baseline, and then they have the guys to deliver in Wilshire. In traffic. Penn State turns it over. Here comes Teague, and he throws it off the leg of the Penn State defense. Penn State substitution, Jermaine Marshall in, and he'll replace Cameron Woodyard, the senior. But Teague really has to get in and watch a lot of tape on how to run the fast break. Right now, he just is lacking in confidence in transition. And Wiltshire's got back-to-back -back assists, the big guy, and a nice bounce pass to Deron Land. Well, that's what John said at halftime to Andy. You know, he's got all the skill in the world. He doesn't have really any weaknesses offensively. He's just on the defensive end of the floor, and John wants him to rebound as well. It's one thing about young players. You can contribute in a number of ways. You don't have to be a scorer only or a rebounder only. No, but you can ma make passes, and that's what Wilshire does. He's a deft passer. Sometimes what he does is he'll step out and make the shot. He's got the right and left hook, but the nice thing for the big guy, he's got the no look as well. Chris Pino, Tim Welsh, Andy Katz here.
at Mohegan Sun Arena, Uncasville, Connecticut. Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off tournament, Kentucky. Rolling in the first half to a huge lead, still up 56-23. Eight schools playing here over the weekend. This one starts the festivities for Saturday, and then South Florida out of the Big East, Old Dominion out of the Colonial Athletic Meet, uh, approximately 2.30 Eastern. And we'll have that for you as well. And then tomorrow, Kentucky plays at noon on ESPNU. We'll be here for that as well. So good early season look at uh, the Wildcats of Kentucky. Retooled after losing a number of guys. The draft, a little jump, hook goes in. So Penn State starting to generate a little bit of offense now. John Graham, the freshman. Nice move there by Graham. Establishing low post position right in the middle of the lane and just pounding Davis, getting into his chest. And that's the way you have to attack a shot block. You can't go weak against Davis. You've got to go right up into his chin and hopefully he'll back down. And that time, Davis lost the battle. A foul the second on Tim Frazier. Darius Miller in the ball game. Wiltshire on the baseline and he shows you he's got touch from 15. That's what we talked about Mike, you know, using the pick and roll, that side action and that time Wiltshire not rolling the basket after the pick, but just kind of the pick and slide and that ability to knock down that mid-range jumper. Wiltshire had a lot of choices coming out of high school. Recruited heavily. Georgia Tech, Gonzaga, Kansas, Texas, Wake Forest. California went with the Wildcats. Block shot that time. Here come the Nittany Lions on the break. Frazier in the paint. Tries to float it up, missed the shot. And the Wildcats will go to the line on the fast break. Well, John Calipari has been a dribble drive expert over the years, but he's put the pick and roll, the pick and pop, and here the pick and slide, the nice little feel here. Wilcher, his man releases on the ball screen, so he slides to that mid-wing, mid-base area. He can knock down that shot, eight out of 10. Here, knocking down, looking, for luck, looking to knock down the three. Calipari, five straight, 30-win campaign, seven overall. And Penn State's been able to score from outside the arc here in the second half. That's something they could not do in the first. They were one of 15. Penn State stayed aggressive, especially defensively. They're feisty. Getting up in the passing lanes a little bit better. Pushing off the low box. Thirteen forty-five left to go in this one. South Florida, Old Dominion next, and another three. Matt Glover has been able to connect, and he started to put some points on the board for Penn State. They were held to just 15 in the opening 20 minutes. Kentucky's defense went from a 10 in the first half to about an 8-5 right now. And I'm sure John Calipari will make note of that at the next timeout. That they've lost a little bit of their pop getting up and closing out on the shooters. Indy Lions have scored more points in six minutes here in the second half than they did in 20 minutes of the first half. And an offensive foul call. As Wiltshire took the pass, tried to lay it up. Give Pat Chambers credit. You know, what he told Andy Katz at halftime was, he was true to his words. You know, they've played this second half like the score is zero to zero, and they've stayed aggressive on the defensive end, and then taken advantage of Kentucky not being as forceful on their defensive end of the floor. Outscored Kentucky 16-11 in the second half. And as you say, Penn State plays again tomorrow. So they got to find something here in this game to bring to the next. Nick Colella's in the game. Where's number 20 for Penn State? Junior. And the ball is thrown out of bounds. A nice job that time by Anthony Davis with Graham before Graham had taken it to his chin. That time 
Green backed away, tried to shoot the quick hook over Davis. Not a good recipe for success. The big fellow threw it back. Now ball deflected in the paint loose. Teague will launch a three, and he's able to drill it with good defense in his face. Marcus Teague is not a great three-point shooter, but he looks capable. He's got a pretty good stroke out there on the floor. He's got to add that to his game. Kind of a line drive shooter. Now he's got the rebound, and he's on the run. Goes alley up, picked off by Penn State. Again, Teague in transition, not ready for prime time. Turns it over two out of three times. Shot missed inside. He's got to learn to slow down. He get, he's so fast with the ball that things have to come in better vision with him as he gets below the three-point line. Instead, he's trying to make the home run play too often. That time, made his own home run play with the three. Teague back to back. He was in a big competition as far as the recruiting wars himself. Cincinnati, Louisville, Ohio State, Purdue. So the Big Ten was after him. A kid from Indianapolis he was a He's a freshman for John Calipari. Got to be a tough call when you're a Midwest kid. And, you know, some of the big programs in your region Ty want you. You know, Ohio State and Purdue have been perennially powerful recently. And then you decide you're going to Kentucky. Usually when this man right there in, in the dark blue suit, though, steps into your living room, he locks it down. One of the best coaches and can recruit as well. Well, we mentioned three straight number one recruiting classes for John Calipari. It's great to get talent in, but Tim Welsh, as you know, you got to coach him up and you got to win. Otherwise, you know, the experts look at you and they say, well, you're underachieving. Well, John Calipari, one thing he can do is he can wear all the hats. He can wear the hat as a coach. He can wear the hat as a public speaker to the boosters, keep them happy. He can recruit. And he also can manage a program, I think, as good as anybody in the country. You know, bringing these guys in and the expectations for every one of these guys that he brings in is to come and go quickly. And he understands that. And to build that into a championship formula, a team environment, is not easy. It's very, very difficult. But John is one, if not the best in the country, at doing that. And these uh, fans, Kentucky Rabbit, of course, very hungry for championships when you coach at places like this or Alabama in football I mean the standard is extremely high the expectation is extremely high not just win your conference championship win the whole thing it's not extremely high it's the highest it's the highest in the country the Kentucky job I don't think there's any job in the country where there's more expectation more pressure but I don't think there's a better man suited maybe ever to handle it than John Calipari. I mean, he, you know, Rick Pitino was a master as well, and give them credit. When they needed a coach. They found the answer in John Calipari. He's the only the second man to lead three teams to Final Fours. So he's proven he can do it no matter where. When he came to Kentucky, though, he said, I just wanted to be in that huge arena, 25,000 people in a home game. There's not, I don't think there's a place in the country. I mean, you can go maybe to Syracuse and pack in 30,000 plus, but aren't too many places you can put 25,000 of your own fans for a home game. Well, for an exhibition game in the first week in November, there's, they want to make sure they win those. And the fans of Kentucky understand that every night it's important. And when we return, that man, Dan Issel, Andy Katz catches up with the Kentucky legend next on ESPN. Well, it's Andy Katz here at the Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off tournament. Kentucky, the winningest college program ever. They put a lot of people in the NBA and starred there as well. Andy Katz standing by now with one of those players, Dan Issel. Thank you, Mike. Certainly one of the all-time greats at Kentucky, playing for the late legendary Adolph Rupp. And Dan, what do you think of what John Calipari has done so far in these first three seasons at Kentucky? It's amazing. I don't know how he gets all this talent there, but... Uh, 
Uh, you know, if he can get them playing as a team instead of a collection of all-stars, it's going to be an exciting march for the UK fans. How much is he sort of best suited to handle all that comes with being the Kentucky head coach? Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously he's been around this for a while now, and he, he understands that all of these kids think they're just one step from the NBA. But, uh, you know, in this day and time, that's the way you have to handle things, and, and John's done a great job. You obviously played in the NBA for many years, coached in the NBA. We're in the midst of an NBA lockout. Where's your optimism? Uh, all I know, Andy, is I've told people in 1999 when I was a GM in Denver, we lost 32 games. We only had a 50-game season, and our differences then weren't even close to the differences now. So uh, I, 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 I'd like to be optimistic, but I don't see a season this year. Really, no season at all? I, I would be very surprised if they had a season. And that's because you think they're so far apart? Yeah, and it's not so much the money. Everybody talks about the split in revenue because that's what everybody understands. But they're really trying to change the system. Uh, you know, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned, the proposal the owners presented moved the age for college kids coming into the NBA up to 20, which I think is great. So they're trying to do a lot of different things. and. Uh, I just think it'll take a while to work it out. What happens to franchises like Denver, to other franchises that maybe aren't like the Knicks or the Lakers if there's no season? Well, I, you know, I think that's the, you just hit the, the crux of the matter. The, the, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots in the NBA, it's starting to look like Major League Baseball. And I think the owners feel they need a system more like uh, the NFL, more like hockey. And if they don't have that system, the league won't survive. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Appreciate it, Dan. All right, Andy. Good visiting with you. Back to you guys. Thank you, Andy. Thanks to Dan Issel. And uh, you have to agree with Dan in the sense that the ownership in the NBA trying to get more revenue sharing feel to their game, to feel like they can protect their interests. And uh, it might cost a season. We don't know. Penn State's Frazier inside, able to go glass. I saw how much Kobe missed on his first check <laughs> on November 15th, and November 30th will be here in about 10 days or so, and another check will be gone so for all these guys. So keep adding those up, and I think uh, the players may reconvene some of their thoughts. When you saw that check, did you spill your orange juice on the newspaper? Well, there was about five or six guys that were listed, I saw. Kevin Garnett and LeBron. They were all in the 700,000 plus range for their first check that they lost. So that's real money that they won't get back. And uh, the wives may get a little upset when the credit cards get lock on lockdown here in a few weeks. So I'm not sure. Uh, they will have. They won't have second thoughts. You have to wonder whether the the players like the Kevin Garnetts of the world and Kobe Bryant don't step up first and say, "Let's get something done," because they are. They stand to lose the most in terms of dollars. Right. And everybody's losing something significant, including people in the broadcast world, the people that sell the hot dogs at the arenas, the parking attendants, and it's really a shame that. You have something successful, and they're throwing it out the window for a period of time here. Meanwhile, college basketball is the, the focus here at O'Hegan Sun Arena, and it will be around the country because it's Frazier can't drop it in. It's tipped in, though, and a nice play that time by the sophomore, Sasha Moriniak. Well, Frazier can get anywhere he wants to go on the floor. The problem is he doesn't have a lot of answers around him. Wiltshire tries a three, and he hits it. Nice feed by Teague that time. Well, John's pre preaching rebounding a defense with Wiltshire, but he keeps up this knockdown ability from the outside and the inside deft passing and finishing. He's, he's going to be on the floor, I think, for John Calipari quite a bit. Terrence Jones had a strong second half. Great feed to Gilchrist, and Gilchrist finishes with a four. Well, the run and attack by Kentucky is so impressive. You just run the lane where you are, push ahead, don't 
advance with the bounce, advance with the dribble, and then the finishers on the other end are more than impressive. And the three goes down. That time for Ross Travis. He's a freshman from Cheska, Minnesota. Got a cousin that plays college basketball as well, Jonah at Howard University. And a nice spin move in the paint that time by Jones. So many answers for Kentucky. Jones so impressive off the defensive end of the floor and then the look ahead, but they are showing his offensive ability in the paint. One thing that Dan Issel just talked to Andy Katz about is John Calipari recruiting players who believe they're going to be playing in the NBA very soon. Nice shot that time and a good finish by Ross Travis. That's not easy to get these guys to think college hoop, think team. We'll be back more on that in just a moment. Timeout. Kentucky 78, Penn State 40. Higgins Sun Arena here in Uncasville, Connecticut. Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off. Mike Crispino, Tim Welch, Andy Katz. Kentucky has been roaring from the opening tip and leading 78 to 40. Kentucky, a Penn State off to a 3-0 start. It hasn't been that frequent during their history to get off to good starts, but they have begun under Patrick Chambers with three wins leading into this as they get to uh, work themselves towards the Big Ten schedule. Second straight year, they've gone 3-0. Fourth time in 12 years. Chambers is one of 12 children, the youngest of the 12. So they had some monumental battles at Thanksgiving, I would think. A Philadelphia guy through and through, and he's going to recruit the Philly area. He signed a young man in the early period from Philly. They're going to get into that market. It's, it's, it's been tough for Penn State to crack the Philly, New Jersey, New York area because those players traditionally have wanted to play in the Big East and they've gone to Pittsburgh. But Pat Chambers has a lot of contacts in the Northeast, so he's going to recruit not only nationally, but really concentrate in Philly, New Jersey. Wiltshire takes the bump and still scores. He's done it in every which way. Kentucky by 40. Kentucky working on their 2-3 zone here in the last six, seven minutes. And they'll probably use this on occasion. John likes to mix and match his defenses, mostly man, but this is a good change up for John Calipari. Baseline jumper off the back rim that time. So Penn State has been a football school for decades, as we all know. Trying to coach basketball at a football school. How difficult is that going to be? Well, it's been done before. There's a lot of schools that look right at Alabama. They're pretty good in football and basketball. Ohio State. Ohio State, LSU. Had a lot of success. Florida with Billy Donovan and Urban Meyer. So it can be done. I don't think that's ever an excuse. I think, you know, Leonard Hamilton at Florida State's had some great success there at a football school. So it can be done for sure. It's just about recruiting, you know, where you get your players. There's no players in and around Penn State. So they've got to go out and find them. And Pat Chambers will. And with more on that, here's Andy Katz. Well, as you mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, Pat Chambers was an assistant at Villanova. And you know, over the course of the Penn State uh, timeline in the Big Ten, they've sort of tried different recruiting avenues. And I think we're going to see Chambers try to get more into the Philadelphia area, try to get the name brand of Penn State a little bit more associated into Philadelphia. Obviously, it has been for decades in football because they've got to find their niche. That's what they've sort of been lacking since they went to the Big Ten. Remember, in basketball, when they were in the A-10, they were very successful. It's been a hard transition in the Big Ten to just find their identity, and Pat Chambers trying to do that uh, to the, where every few years they can be competitive and be in that upper half. It just took uh, Ed Dichelis quite a while, finally got over the hump, and then he left. Yeah, they were 9-9 nine and nine last year, just the fifth time in 20 years in the Big Ten. They've been able to be a 500 conference team. They got to get people back in that Bryce Jordan center too, Tim Welsh, because they average about 50% capacity. And they were 13 and five at home last year. They created a lot of excitement. And when you win, you get people to come watch your games. It's a beautiful facility. Oh, a they have facility. all the bells and whistles you need to be successful as far as facilities. The, the campus is second to none. The Bryce Jordan 
as well, and now they've built a beautiful practice facility, so they have all of that. But again, as we said, it's where do you get your players? You know, do the kids from Philadelphia, New Jersey, very difficult to recruit them to Penn State because those kids traditionally don't associate themselves with playing in the Big Ten. They want to play in the Big East. They want to play in areas where their families can come to the games. The Big Ten doesn't play on the East Coast, so that becomes a tricky situation in recruiting, but Pat Chambers has the connections in Philly. He'll probably slowly try to get into that market as he builds success. And speaking of tradition, you, you recruit someone to Kentucky, all you have to do is look up in the, the rafters and see all the conference championships, the national championships. I think you have to recruit a type of player to a Penn State that wants to to move the program forward towards that. And right. It's not easy for a guy to take that risk as a young, young Absolutely, man. Absolutely, because you know, you've got offers on the table from schools that you're familiar with or schools that you're not familiar with. And right now, you know, the brand of Penn State is solid as far as basketball. Eddie DeCellis laid the foundation. And Pat Chambers knows how to win. Learned under Jay Wright and did, had his own success at Boston U. So there's no doubt in my mind he's the right guy for this job. Ron Lamb goes to the bench, got 25 points, four minutes to go. Kentucky will play the winner of Old Dominion and South Florida. That'll be tomorrow at noon on ESPNU. Timeout, 3.58 remaining. We'll be back. The Wildcats, big. Tip-off tournament. Kentucky 82, Penn State 43. Mike Crispino, Tim Welsh. Penn State has played number two ranked teams 11 times now in their history. They're one and nine as they got into this one. Uh, later, after this one concludes, it's South Florida Old Dominion. Old Dominion, tremendous success in the last few years going to the NCAA tournament. Kent Bazemore, preseason all colonial, been hampered with injuries so far this year. He's the key to their season. And with South Florida, I think, is ready to make a move from kind of the lower tier of the Big East towards the middle, which could get them in the hunt for the NCAA tournament under Stan Heath. Well, the Kentucky faithful seeing what their team can do at a peak efficiency here. Penn State down 39, their worst defeat in their history, much more than that. So they'll try to avoid it. Look out. Their biggest loss to Navy back in the mid 80s. 103 to 50. Would that have been David Robinson? In 85, I'm assuming that. 103 points. It was David Robinson, the Admiral. Now, if Ed DeCellis could find another David Robinson, that would make things much different for him at Navy well, <laughs> this season. Life in Annapolis is usually quite enjoyable, but if you get have David Robinson on your pro, in your program, that would bring you a long way. And David Robinson, people forget, was 6'7 when he went to Navy, and grew to 6'11 grew to or 7 feet. Well, Deron Lamb has had a sensational game in this one. 26 points to lead the way. And they've had Kyle Wiltshire with 19. So the two of those players accounting for 45 points of the 82. You've got to love John Calipari. He's over there yelling at the walk-ons to shoot. <laughs> he doesn't stop coaching even when he's up 40. Well... With all that talent, you gotta have the guys that can help you in practice, the guys that every day come to work. Nice move that time. Strong move to the bucket by Ross Travis. Well, the biggest misconception, and I laugh when I hear it, is that John just rolls out the ball and he's got balls and he's got all the talent in the world and that's why he wins. Well, that's the farthest thing from the truth. Having coached against his teams over the years, he is a tactician, one of the best X and O guys and a perfectionist in practice with his team. Well, he was telling Andy Katz at halftime, remember the SEC, it's not a conference that you can walk into and just beat everybody. I mean, you've got Alabama's going to have a good year this year. Arkansas with the new coaching. 
winning his coaches since 05-06. Ohio State's that model, Roy Williams, now at North Carolina. Mike Krzyzewski, of course, the all-time wins leader. And Coach Cal, who uh, did it for almost a decade at Memphis and then moved to Kentucky. I think it's a great credit for John to bring his team here to this event. The Hall of Fame, certainly a, uh, something we all cherish, the Basketball Hall of Fame, and under John understanding it well, having coached at UMass right down the road from the Hall of Fame, but they're, they're trying to really re-energize this event, bringing it to the Mohegan Sun. Ball deflected out of bounds. It'll be, let's see, I believe it'll be Penn State basketball. Well, wherever Kentucky goes, especially now with Calipari in charge, they're going to draw a crowd. And not only their own crowd, but among the fans here, college basketball fans who want to see what the Wildcats are all about. People may be confused. There, there is not a Kentucky team store here in the Mohegan Sun <laughs> Resort. <laughs> These are, there are a lot of fans here from Big Blue Country. Wiltshire will pull up, now fire to try to get somebody another shot, and they do get one of the walk ones And a foul call, so Brian Long, a New Jersey kid, at 5-9, goes to the line for Kentucky. Well, that may be something John uses tonight, did that last set in tonight back in the hotel on how to throw the extra pass. The walk-ons looking for each other, and then Kyle Wiltshire making sure one of the buddies, his younger buddies, so all those McDonald All-Americans, here's Ron Strickland, former New York Nick. Well, you have, to be nice to, you, you have to be nice to the walk-ons, Mike, because of the fact they're usually the guys that have a car. <laughs> and they help you get to McDonald's on that Sunday afternoon when you don't have practice. So be nice to those guys because they're usually the guys with a little extra benefit on the side. So all the details that you... Important, about important stuff, Important Mike. details, absolutely. Final minute, 10. It's Kentucky back up by 40. They held Penn State to 15 first half points. Uh, the Nittany Lions could not hit from outside. And they fell in a huge hole and weren't able to recover. But that Southeast Conference, uh, Tennessee, Mississippi State had a couple of real good wins at the Garden this week. They did, after the getting beat by Akron earlier in the tournament. Very impressive in the Garden. And then tonight, Vanderbilt will play NC State in New Jersey. Uh, Florida's good. They've already got off to a good start. They're coming up in a few minutes here. South Florida Old Dominion meet. We'll have it for you. Well, Augustus Gilchrist is an important piece for Stan Heath's team. Who had an uneven career. His number so far this year, dominating rebounder. There's a steal by Colella. He goes in and misses the layup, but it's boarded by Penn State's Kevin, Kevin Watmany, freshman himself from Center Hall, Pennsylvania. And Kentucky will just Put the freeze on to end this one. But the Wildcats treating their fans who traveled a long way here to Connecticut. To an 85-47 victory. Final score, Kentucky 85. So Calipari goes to 3-0 in the new season with Kentucky. Penn State drops to 3-1. Now for today's player of the game, it's brought to you by the Basketball Hall of Fame, where the game never ends. Ron Lamb was super for John Calipari, early and off and doing a lot off the bounce, running the team in transition, defensively with the active hands. But one thing he does is finish in transition. 
So Lamb with a little bit of everything, eight of 13 shooting, made three out of three threes. All seven of his free throws, four rebounds, two assists. Now we send it over to Andy Katz. Thank you, Mike, with Deron Lamb. And Deron, uh, what's been the difference here in the first half, the way you guys were able to blow up Penn State that maybe you didn't have against Marist and Kansas? We just came out hard in the first half with a lot of energy, a lot of defense, and we just made a lot of shots. Putting together a full 40 minutes, what's the ceiling on this team? On this team? We got a great team. We got all pieces uh, to the puzzle. We got to keep playing hard to the end. Everyone saw a lot more of Kyle Wilcher today and his skill set. What's the difference for this team when he can contribute that way? Well, he's a great part of our team. He makes shots, pick and pop play, and rebounds. We keep rebounding, we go far in the tournament. So how would you assess this road trip so far? I'm having a ball. Back to you guys. <laughs> Short and sweet. They're on Lamb. He's having a ball. Kentucky will beat Kansas at the Garden, and they win here over Penn State. Why not? He's from Queens. <laughs> he's been in New York, at Connecticut, and hanging out. And I'm sure he's uh, having fun on the court as well. And that's the one thing about Deron Lamb. He d loves to play. He plays in a lot of different ways, a lot of different positions for John Calipari. Maybe not their best player, but as I said before, their most important player. And Kentucky plays tomorrow at noon on ESPNU against the winner of South Florida and Old Dominion. So for Tim Welsh and Andy Katz, I'm Mike Crispino saying so long. From the Mohegan Sun, the final score, Kentucky 85, Penn State 47. To watch this entire game on replay, as well as other games on our family of ESPN networks, log on to watchespn.com or download the Watch ESPN app. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Kentucky, second in the country, playing like it, 85-47.